I'm excited to have with me today internationally renowned comedian Daryl Lennox. Daryl is here today to talk about his successful comedy career and his latest comedy album, Super Bloom. Yes, welcome, Daryl. How are you? Oh, I'm very great. Thanks for having me, Christine. It's an honor to be on your show. Well, it's an honor to have you. And congratulations on your album, Super Bloom. And what's the feedback been like so far? Uh, it's been exciting. People have seemed to connect with it. Uh, it's really a metaphor. It's not just my life. I think some of that people, people can all relate about that from what seemingly is utter devastation can come out, can, can produce pronounced beauty. Uh, so that's really a metaphor for my life. And I think people are resonating with it. So I've been really, really quite pleased with the response and the feedback. That's wonderful. No, I, I love the title. And, and it was released uh, recently, December 17th. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, December 17th, it released. And uh, it was very cool, very exciting. Yes. And again, I love the title. And what was the, the inspiration behind it? Um, so as we've all gone through many tough things in life, right around 2000, 18 or 19, not exactly sure, uh, California, the fires in Northern California had uh, really run rampant and destroyed a lot of the section of the California communities and homes. Some lives were lost. And if that wasn't enough, then there was torrential flooding from rain, uh, which, and so it was like fire, flood, almost biblical. And so mm -hmm. I was really, really struck by, you know, where's the, where's the hope in this, something like that? When it happens like that, you lose fire, destroys your home, and then flooding. And then uh, because the fire oxidized the soil, it caused uh, a burst of poppies so incredibly beautiful and pre-season uh, that people from all around the world flew in to see those, those poppies and it resurrected the, the, the community's financial uh, straits. And so it really struck a chord with me because at that time of my life, um, my uh, my first wife, who uh, we had been only married for four months, but we remained close friends, uh, committed suicide, and then my father, uh, who you know really has had the biggest impact on my life than anybody, uh, had come with cancer and decided he was not going to fight it. So I was looking for some sort of universe life-driven, you know, answers, and when I got that, the, the super bloom happened. Uh, it made made sense to me, and so that's where the title came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, and like there are eleven stories on the album. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit? Like you, you have like the first one, I believe, is Super Bloom, and then you got No, No, No. But can you tell us a little bit about the stories? Um, well. Uh, let me backtrack a little bit with uh, some people who haven't uh, familiar with my work. The album in Genesis, um, uh, 2012, I believe, uh, we recorded a special Blind Ambition at the Vogue Theater in Vancouver, my favorite city in the world. And mm -hmm. that turned into an album and a successful uh, comedy special on the cable in the States. Uh, and so, but the, the thesis of that was that I was having surgery and I was so afraid of becoming totally blind that I had uh, some suicidal thoughts. And if the surgery didn't work out, that's what I thought I would do to myself. But the surgery worked out, and so I had new perspective. Uh, and fast forward some eight years later, um, I did become totally blind. And so no longer do I feel any hindrance of being blind or fear of it. It's really turned my whole life upside down in incredibly positive ways. So that's what the album Super Bloom was about, a follow-up to that. Um, and so learning how to not take everything so seriously and realize it's not about me anymore. Because when I look into the mirror, uh, Christine, I can't see me anymore. So life isn't about me. It's about making other people aware of how they're feeling and whatnot. So the after Super Bloom introductory track, the second track is called No, 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 where um, – I was standing on the street in Toronto 
waiting for a cab to get to uh, the comedy club. And the driver knew I was visually impaired. It was instructed to call my name, and I walked toward the vehicle. So I walk over there with my stick, just hop in. So uh, I what? I grabbed the driver's door, and I sat on the driver. Uh, he was going, oh. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, uh, it's... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like like for your inspiration to write, it's... it's um. Would you say like it's your energy you get from from others and and how you feel like um, you know like can you tell us about you know how how you feel like your inspiration like the energy you get from others? Whatever they're feeling, I uh, kind of can feel it energetically, and then mm -hmm. either I feel like they were brought to me or I was brought to them, so we can kind of see what purpose we're supposed to have in each other's lives. Sometimes it's just, you know, I've had people just want to come to the next one. I don't know why, but I they just sit and talk to you for a little while. So, okay. So I'll sit and talk to somebody. And there have been times when, you know, I need to just be out amongst people so I can feel other energies and hear sounds and other things. Just, uh, it's just life affirming. And I think in today's world, you know, so caught up in some of our dogmas and whatnot, but uh, when you just get around people and feel energy and listen to them talk, it, it, it can be healing in a lot of ways. It certainly is for me. Mm -hmm. Like, um, Daryl, can you tell us, like, how, how has comedy evolved? Like, like you've, been, you've been in the business for over 30 years. Is that right? That's right. That's right. It'll be year 33 uh, wow. on January 1. Yep. Yeah, what a journey. How has it evolved? Um, it's it might sound surprising, but not much. You know, comedy in its essence as is still basically just a game of peekaboo. Um, mm -hmm. That's where your first sense of humor is as a, a child, right? Uh, peekaboo, you, you, you can play that game a thousand times over. The kid still laughs at it. The baby still laughs at it. So still the element of surprise. But how we get to the laugh, you know, is slightly different, but it's still a surprise. Uh, in terms of now uh, people feeling that it's a little, you know, over uh, politicized or people feel like there's, you know, too much pushback from expression, I don't think it's any different than it ever has been. Um, but the better you are at it, the less you worry about those sorts of things. And for the newer comics, I would say, you know, just trust your sense of humor and, you know, that's used the best, the best guys just do what feels right to you and people will adjust to it. Mm -hmm. Like, and also too, it's like, we need comedy. We need it uh, more and more in our lives and you are making a difference. You're impacting others. And like, how does it feel when you're, you know, you're on stage or um, whether it's a small audience or, or, you know, a large audience and, and they're laughing and they're, they're really being entertained. Like, how does it, can you tell us a memorable moment? Like, was there a time where it was just so fantastic or, or, you know, or is it always fantastic? Um, it's, uh, I love it. I've done my whole life for it, but after a while, it wasn't about trying to get the laughs, um, as much as it was, you know, get so many people in a room, whether it be, Two or two thousand. There's um, there's almost like an energy illusion. There's a coming together uh, of you know kind of one thought, one mind, the shared moment. It's very intimate. It's very intimate. So if, you know if you ever been in love with somebody, you have one of those one moments where they're just in a movie that you both really get into, and somebody might cry, and you're it's one of those great moments, maybe when you, you know, you and a baby and it's just, it's, it's just a perfect moment of blended energies in this one moment. And so that's what I'm always trying to create when I'm on stage um, with the, my voice and the way I speak and how I can get them to laugh and find nuances about the town or, or hear something to audience. I just, I really try to create that really cool, cool moment of, we all coalesce into this one space. 
Mm -hmm. And your passion for comedy, did you always want to be a comedian? No, uh, it didn't cross my mind until um, I was in college in Seattle and I was in love. My -hmm. first ever girlfriend was Margaret Reed. She's an Aquarius. She changed my life. She's 70 years older than I was. I was 20. She was 37. I was a big dreamer. Still am, as you can't tell. And I was dreaming of playing pro basketball. And, uh, and you know, she had kids of her own. And here I was just a big kid, uh, basically. And one day, after a couple of years, she said, all you do is dream. You don't finish anything. All you do is talk and dream and don't finish anything. What are you going to do with your real life? What are you going to do if you don't make it to the NBA? And it really scared me because I never thought about not making it. And so we got into a huge argument. I stormed out. And then I went and I saw in the newspaper, it said, open my comedy. Mm. I'm the underground in Seattle. So I just called the club and they said, you come down on Monday at seven o'clock and sign up. So I did. Uh, <laughs> and, wow. and that was it. I got on stage and, I, and I, I've never had a job or stepped off stage since then. Wow. I mean, so were you nervous or, or any, like, like, how did you feel? Um, I was not nervous. I had made up a goofy story about a movie I'd seen recently, and I wore my basketball jersey underneath my <laughs> clothes for some confidence because I thought even if I bomb, nobody's room is better than me at basketball. And to let you know when your time's up, there's a red light in every conference. There's a red light that blinks. There you got two minutes to wrap it up or one minute to wrap it up. So there was a lady on stage at the open mic, and she was doing horribly poor. And she didn't see the light, so she's going longer and longer. You're supposed to do five, and she's up there around seven minutes. So finally, the audience members started waving the red candles at her. <laughs> the whole crowd took <laughs> So that's when I got nervous. That's when I got nervous. Oh, boy, this is not going to happen to me. So when I get nervous, I get... I get ready to fight. I get more, okay, I'm going to fight the flame rather than run for the flame. I got my, that got my intensity up, and then I was able to go on stage and, and do well. Yes, and, you know, Daryl, like, how, can you tell us about, you know, being prepared? Like, you know, how do you prepare for a show? Like, um, what's involved? Like, uh, I mean, do you have any rituals? Like, you know, your script, um, depending where you're you're doing your show and and the audience like can you tell us you know any any preparation tips that you use or rituals or all right just because i like your voice i'm let you behind the curtain okay (laughs) um so before uh i uh lost my vision i would go for long walks in the in whatever neighborhood of the club i was in I just look and feel for something I might be able to pick out. Kind of get out of my conscious, let my subconscious creep. So I just walk. Then before, then it became, um, I'd write out my set word for word so I could memorize it. Then as I got more more successful in the game, it became, okay, treat like a profession. So I don't talk a lot. Uh, I listen to music, you know, shower once, uh, and then, pick my favorite songs back then to get me motivated. Now, at this stage uh, in my game, since I can't write anymore, I can't go for long walks by myself, uh, I listen to tons and tons of comedy. Just put on Sirius and I'm listen to comedy. Just so my brain starts to process humor again. Uh, and since I can't write anymore, everything's based on you know, something I might remind I have a memory of telling this story before or just basically go out there on stage and, and let it create. But it's it's a total consumption is what I have to do to prepare. Total consumption in comedy and keep my mind open. Mm-hmm. Listen to music. Tons of music. That's wonderful. And and what does your family think of you? You're you're you know, you're so successful. Um have you always how to support a uh, support a family, I should say. Nope. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, no. I, no. 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 Um, my my mother didn't get it. Uh, she said, "I just don't think you're funny." Uh, and then 
what changed her mind, I think, uh, Two things happened. One, uh, she was with Switchboard Operator in Las Vegas, and a famous comedian was uh, called down, and she said, oh, you're a comedian. My son's going to she goes, well, who's your son? And my mom goes, Daryl Lunch. She goes, he's very funny. So my mom goes, wow, that person thought you funny, so you must be funny. The second time I got affirmation from my mom, was she was wearing a T-shirt of mine for my special blind ambitions at the grocery store in Las Vegas at Walmart, and the cashier goes, you know Daryl Lennox? And she goes, yes, I made Daryl Lennox. So the cashier <laughs> gave her the groceries for free. So oh. from that moment on, <laughs> my mom has been my biggest fan. <laughs> oh, my she didn't start out that way. She didn't start out that way. Uh, my father is my a very big fan as well, but he was he just wasn't around in the early stages of my career. But all my oh. sisters and everybody, uh, they're very supportive now. Well, that's wonderful, Daryl. You know? And that's such a... You know, funny story, but a great story. I, I just love hearing it. It's, it's wonderful. Thank and, you. Yeah. So, what is what is next for you? Um, comedically, uh, I would like to turn this album into another comedy special, um, mm -hmm. and then whatever comes with that. Uh, business wise, I've been on a venture of um, um, taking over some comedy clubs. You know, I've always I owe so much of my life to Canada and the Canadian comedy community. And uh, I've been working on a deal to try to acquire the Yuck Yucks franchise. And so I'm getting closer to that. But I really believe so much in that franchise and that country that I kind of want to pump some new life into it and kind of help exalt and raise some standards of what I think the Canadian comedy community is capable of. And I want to try to expand, expand that brand into the U.S. So we're working on a choir club down in Florida right now as well. But I want to, at some point, make comedy clubs just impeccable places for work so the industry isn't so feast or famine. You shouldn't have to be as famous as Jim Carrey uh, and just famine where you're living in a car, leaving hand to mouth. There's got to be a place in between those two things. And I believe that should be the comedy club community. So that's really, that's really a huge passion for me. So whatever success I get from my albums and specials, those sorts of things will be driving that, will be driving that platform of the business. Yes. Great. And where can people listen to your, your album? It's on cloud, right? Um, it's on every platform, what music yeah. platform you have, Amazon, um, iTunes, Apple, Spotify, it's out there. Yes. And your your website too, right? Yep, yep, DarylLennox.com, and then I'm on all the social media things. It's me, it's me saying it. It's obviously me not writing or typing it, but I'm telling somebody and they're putting it up there, so everybody know that. Right, and Daryl, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um... No, I don't think so. This is always therapeutic to get to talk to to people about this process and talking who I am. I really appreciate the opportunity. That's no, is wonderful, and I I love to interview you again um, in six Absolutely. months. If that's okay. Uh, sure, I'll probably be back in Vancouver then, so that's it won't be so uh, Zoom call in type things, but. Uh, I would love to. I like to. I like to ask you a bunch of questions when we interview each other next time. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please do. I mean, it was a pleasure okay. interviewing thank you, you and much. sharing your story. And thank you again. What attracted you to the role? I loved how different it was for me, and uh, so that's always fun to dive into. And uh, Niav. Niav is just, she had such an incredible story that I thought I, I needed to be a part of this. And, and I lucked out. Originally, I was only scheduled to do one day on the shoot of part two of the film. And she, she called me up a few months after we shot and asked if I would be interested in being in part three. And I jumped to the chance because it's such a fantastic character. Yeah. So you play the dad. And I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if we were saying that out loud uh, for people or not. But. <laughs> <laughs>
but yes, uh, yeah, he's a troubled soul. He's he's a war veteran and uh, dealing with PTSD and opioid addiction, and uh, he's thrust upon his uh, young daughter, who he really hasn't met before, and uh, trying to deal with that uh, along with everything else that he's dealing with. How did you prepare for this role? Like, was it challenging? Absolutely. Uh, I I have two friends who got over an opioid addiction. So mm-hmm. I talked with them at length about uh, mindset and physicality. And, uh, and uh, I give them huge props for making, being able to get to the other side of that because it's, it's a terrible thing to be dealing with or going through. And so I did. I talked to them at length. And that really helped to find Lonnie for me. Mm-hmm. And what was that like working with Emma? Because there's a, you know, the father-daughter relationship. Yes. I I just, Audrey is such a joy to work with uh, on set and off set. uh, And she's such a professional. It really, she kind of set the tone because she had already been doing, she did part one and I came in and she just did her job, but did it beautifully and always with a smile on her face. And so it really just helped ease me into and, and having Holter there as well. And mm-hmm. it, it was, it was a great day on set. Yes. And Holter, what attracted you to the role? Uh, it's, it's a sort of a, I'll make it a, as less circuitous as possible. Uh, Neo directed me in an Edgar Allan Poe play in college. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, if you, if you saw it, you'd be like, right, this is Neo. She, <laughs> she already had the style that she has. Um, and we had sort of lost touch, but when she was writing Rick, she sort of remembered me, which is, I actually take as a compliment, even if you watch the film, <laughs> um, just aspects of, of Rick. And, and also just, she remembered my acting as well as she remembered me. And so I think she was like, I, there's a visual I could see, and I think Holter could probably do this. So she didn't really have my info and reached out, kind of a friend of a friend of a thing. And, uh, and I went to audition after very briefly looking at part one and it, it, it was the, the bad guy, but a, mm-hmm. a good bad guy makes you like him or her, you know? Like if, if, you, if you can't humanize a bad guy, don't have one. <laughs>